Okay. All right. So Monopoly has a bunch of different areas besides just, you know, the what we think of when we think of Monopoly. And we often think of Monopoly as this awful event, you know, that we need to have government to protect us from, that if we didn't have government to protect us, then businesses would just become monopolies and you know every single industry would become a monopoly with no competitors now we have seen that to not be true in the real world but that belief still persists but we still need to kind of understand what monopolies are because they do exist and how they behave and you know what are the economics behind a monopoly so first things first you know we talked the other day about perfect competition that's one extreme you know in perfect competition you have many sellers selling identical products so they compete on price and no firm has any control over price if the price goes it, you know everybody has to sell at the equilibrium price and the one thing that really characterizes perfect competition is there's free entry and exit from the market that in any firm can enter or exit the that market at little cost. Kind of again, think of a farmer's market where you have, you know, one person selling years of corn for a dollar, then somebody else shows up and sells them for 90 cents. The first person has a choice. They can either lower the price to 90 cents or stop selling corn. If it costs them more than 90 cents to sell corn, they're not going to sell. If it costs them 90 cents or less, they will. And then somebody else comes in and starts selling for 85 cents. So they get all of the customers now. And the other two now have a choice whether to go out of business or lower the price to 85 cents. And so that's how perfect competition works. That the person, the company, the firm able to sell at the lowest price always gets the sale. In Monopoly, it's the exact opposite. Instead of many sellers, you have one seller. Instead of a, I, you know, instead of many sellers selling identical products, you have one seller with a unique product with no close substitutes. The reason why monopoly conditions exist is because the entry into the market is impossible. The barriers to entry are impossible, and that's due to one of several factors. One of them might be because one company owns a, the exclusively owns a vital resource. And a lot of times that's because of a government patent. There is some legal barrier that makes it difficult for others to compete. Or if it's, you know, economies of scale, in other words, where one large firm can sell things at a lower cost than multiple smaller firms. And another place, the one place we often can kind of see some degree of a monopoly, if you will, is what we call network goods. Social media is a great example of network goods. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram are all network goods where your use of the good depends on other, you know, your use and enjoyment of the good depends on other people using and enjoying it as well. You know, Google tried to come out with its own social media platform a few years ago called Google Plus, and nobody was on it. Nobody did it. Nobody used it. And so Google quietly did away with it because, and because nobody was using it, it, you know, it really had no usefulness. MySpace was kind of the original social media network, but over time people stopped using it and it went away. And so, you know, a network good kind of almost has to kind of take on the quote unquote monopoly characteristic just simply because it you know, because you have to have a critical mass of people using it for it to work. But even with that, Twitter's not a monopoly because there are competitors to Twitter. There's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's TikTok. They, you know, um, now Facebook and Instagram are the same company. Twitter is its own company. Um, you know, but there's multiple competing social media outlets. So you can't even say they have monopolies. Um, the one thing to note about a monopoly is they're what we call price makers. Remember, perfect competition, each firm's a price taker. They have to take whatever price exists. In a monopoly, each firm is a price maker. In other words, each firm is able to basically set the price um, wherever it wants, but it's still going to follow 
kind of the rules that we had set before. So the one thing to note about a monopolist is that, you know, in perfect competition, the demand curve is horizontal because of the fact that the price essentially is set by whomever is able to sell it at the lowest cost and everybody else has to either follow or get out of the market. Um, in monopoly, because there's only one firm, they essentially face a downward sloping demand curve. And, you know, so that's a normal demand curve, a typical downward sloping demand curve. And the reason why is, is that you have only one seller, but you have a bunch of different consumers, all of whom are willing to pay different prices for a good. And so for a monopolist, the, the important thing is to know what, you know, what is the optimal price to sell at? And the way you need to know that is what is the optimal output? And just like anything else, they will look for where does the marginal revenue equal the marginal cost, okay? And so, um, and so just like in perfect competition, we'll see the other two forms of competition we'll look at the next two days, we'll, we'll kind of see that where profit is maximized or marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so um, real quick, there's four types of monopolies. This is not in the textbook, okay? Uh, but there's generally accepted four types of monopolies. Number one, it's the natural monopoly, and that is where it's just infeasible for two sellers in an area to compete. You know, think about your neighborhood or where you live. It would be really unwieldy to have two different companies or three companies running a sewer line into your neighborhood. And then you have the decision whether or not to, you know, connect with, you know, say, Gem Utilities or Indiana Water Company or let's say Nine Star ran sewer lines, you know, you know, and you would have to decide which one to hook up to. That would be really, really, really difficult and unfeasible. And it would be very costly for those companies, too, because every time you're on a sewer line, you get a bury, you know, new sewer cable or new sewer tunnels. And um, essentially what that does is it requires, you know, tearing up roads and things like that. And so it becomes very costly to do that. So essentially what happens in a natural monopoly is the local government grants a monopoly to one business. They grant an exclusive right to one business to operate in an area in exchange for that government agency usually gets some oversight on the prices. So for example, you know, some of you Duke energy provides your electricity. Some of you it's nine star connect. They have an exclusive right to provide electricity to your neighborhood. In exchange for that, they cannot raise rates. You know, they can't raise prices for electricity without the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission approving them. Uh, matter of fact, Duke recently was going to the IURC begging for a rate increase to make up for the fact that it lost a lot of money during the pandemic. And the IURC basically looked at them and said, no. So, um, so that's a natural monopoly. It just doesn't make sense for there to be two sellers in an area. This used to be the case for the phone companies and cable TV. However, the phone companies realized they could sell cable TV and the cable companies realized they could sell phone services and then cell phones and satellites competed with both of them. And so now that has gone from a monopoly to kind of an oligopoly or even a monopolistic competition setup that we'll look at in the next couple of days. So the second type of monopoly is the government monopoly, which is just simply one that is owned by the government. For example, the post office is a government monopoly. And the government, because of that, can set up conditions that is favorable to its owned business and thus unfavorable to others. So, for example, yes, FedEx and UPS exist and essentially compete with the Postal Service, but the, the government, because it's subsidized by taxpayers, can offer lower rates and lower prices. But the other thing that it can do is FedEx and UPS are not allowed to use your mailbox by law. The mailbox belongs to the U.S. Postal Service. Now, you have to pay for it and you have to maintain it, but it belongs to the Postal Service once it's put up. So because of that, nobody else is allowed to use it. And it is a federal crime if somebody who is not the U.S. Postal Service places something in or takes something out of a mailbox. 
So because of that, if you want to send something versus you know, by FedEx, you have to go to a FedEx store or a FedEx shipping place or a FedEx Dropbox. Whereas if I want to send something by the U.S. mail, all I have to do is walk out to the curb and pull a flag up on my mailbox. Um, and so, you know, it's a government monopoly. Your public school, you know, our school is a government monopoly. It's owned by the local government. We have the exclusive right to provide public education in the two townships we serve. Greenfield Central just can't plant a school in Sugar Creek Township. Um, but... You know, we have the exclusive right here. And in turn, everybody who lives in our school district has the right to attend our schools. Now, some may choose not to. Okay, Some may choose to cross district lines and go elsewhere. You know, some of you may have chosen that cross district lines and come to us. Obviously, some people choose private schools, but, you know, they operate at a, under essentially very unfavorable conditions. You have to pay tuition to go to a private school. You don't have to pay tuition to come here and so forth and so on. So it essentially is a government monopoly. You know, it's owned by the government. Um, a technological monopoly is, again, one granted by a government patent. I, I don't know if you've noticed a, a little theme here between the first three. A government patent is where the government gives one firm the exclusive right to sell something. Um, you know, for example, when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he was granted a patent and only the Bell Company could sell telephones. And that was pretty much the case for about 80 to 85 years after the, um, after the telephone was invented. But only Alexander Graham Bell's company could sell telephones. Um, and because of that, you know, even when I was growing up, you had to rent your phone. You were not allowed to own your own phones. You had to rent your telephone from Indiana Bell. Um, and so, you know, they were granted a monopoly over phone service. Um, in It's probably most notable in medicine where, you know, for example, when Eli Lilly comes out with a new medicine, you know, it costs millions of dollars to research and test and bring a medicine to market and to get FDA approval and approval of other countries' versions of the FDA as well. And so as a result, to allow that company to kind of recapture the costs that it made in researching and developing and inventing something, you know, allow an inventor the ability to recapture those costs, the government usually grants a monopoly for, a, in medicines, it's 20 years for a set period of time. And that's a technological monopoly. I don't know if you notice something here. In the first three, it's not the government that has protected us from the monopolies. It's the government that has granted them, overseen them, and protected them. Okay, And I think that runs counter to the prevailing wisdom, which is we need government to protect us from monopolies. Usually, it's actually the other way around, where the monopolies that exist are created by and protected by government. And, you know... The last one is the one that government really doesn't have anything to do with, and it's the geographic monopoly. In a geographic monopoly, this is one that exists just simply because there's not enough consumers in an area to support competition. So, for example, you know, the, the classic example of a geographic monopoly is the gas station in the desert um, or a store in a rural community where there's just no real you know, there's just not enough customers to support another one, you know, and I'll give you a good example is the, the gas station at nine and 52. Uh, if you're driving down us 52 toward Morristown, you know, you go through Fountaintown and Carrollton and, you know, you'll eventually see this huge gas station at nine and 52. They essentially have a geographic monopoly. There is not a gas station within a four or five mile radius of that one. Okay. And so, they basically have a geographic monopoly. Why? Because there's just not enough traffic and not enough customers in that area, that Brandywine Township, Fountain Town, Northern Shelby County area to justify having multiple gas stations. There just aren't enough customers to make two gas stations profitable. You know, that's why, you know, for example, you know, Needlers, we have one grocery store in town. And so at least for the, you know, three or four mile radius, they're the only grocery store, so they essentially have at least a small geographic monopoly because of the fact that, you know, while Sugar Creek Township is growing, 
our population is still not large enough to support multiple grocery stores. And so as we grow, that will probably change just as it has changed with our gas stations, right? So, you know, and again, note what is not here is the standard oil idea where a large company just gobbles up all its competitors and quote unquote runs them out of business until there's none left. Um, there's no real evidence of that actually happening because often once a company grows its market share to monopoly status, you know, like standard oil got to 90% market share in market share, by the way, it's just out of how many dollars spent on that good, how many of them went to you? Okay. Um, so often if a company grows to monopoly status, naturally its profitability will invite newer, more innovative companies to come in. And, you know, we've seen that Microsoft 25 years ago was declared a monopoly in computing and, you know, at least computer software. And nobody would argue Microsoft had a monopoly today, not because the government broke them up, but because Apple came in with better products. Google, came, you know, took advantage of kind of the move to online and began to come up with things that compete with Microsoft, like what we're using right now. Google Sheets or Google Slides competes with PowerPoint. Google Sheets competes with uh, Excel. You know, Google Docs competes with Word. And because, and because those are free to the consumer, Microsoft has lost its market share. And, you know, as we have moved from desktop and laptop computers to mobile, Microsoft completely missed that boat. And that's what often happens with large companies is they get so entrenched and set in their ways that they miss changes in the market. And because of that, their market share does not last very long. And it gets eaten into fairly quickly because new, more innovative competitors capture more and more of it. You know, there are companies like the A&P grocery stores. They've been gone for 40 years. They were once the biggest grocery store chain in America and were at one time thought to basically be on the verge of monopoly. You know, they were kind of the Amazon or the Walmart of their day. But, you know, Sears was the Amazon of its day. Sears is basically bankrupt now and declining rapidly. You know why? Because Sears did not adapt to changes in the market. And, you know, A&P did not adapt to changes in the market, changes in the way we lived. Um, you know, in the case of A&P, it was because as people moved to the suburbs, A&P stores did not move with them. Um, and so they did not serve you know, these newer growing communities. In the case of Sears, it's as people ironically moved, you know, moved back from going to malls in the suburbs to buying stuff online. Sears, which basically created the mail order business in the 1800s, did not make that shift with everybody. And, and as a result, um, you know, they got beat out by newer, more innovative competitors like Amazon. So, um, in monopoly, we still maximize profit. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. But the difference is that the demand curve for a monopolist is downward sloping. And because people will buy at different prices, the marginal revenue is always one half of demand. And um, the, the marginal revenue curve is always one half of the demand curve. And the reason for this is because people are willing to, to, to pay different prices. And page 165 of your book has a really good illustration of how this works and why marginal revenue, the marginal revenue curve ends up being one half of the demand curve. Um, and so the price set by the monopolist then is the point where the demand curve intersects the output of marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And the difference between the marginal cost and the price at that point is your profit. So, um, so um, because the average, because your marginal cost and, you know, and so essentially what we're going to be doing is we look at the marginal cost curve to see where profit is maximized. And then the difference between the, average total cost and the demand or the average revenue at that price, at that point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost equals the, um, you know, is your profit. And I'll show you how this works here. 
Um, so take a look here at this graph, okay? This light green line is our demand curve, also average revenue, okay? The dark green line is the marginal revenue. It is one half of the average revenue curve, okay? Uh, it's one half of the demand curve. So if you want to figure out the slope of the marginal revenue curve, just the demand curve divided by two. So at this point here, marginal revenue equals marginal cost at a quantity of six. Okay. Now we will assume that this is also the average total cost. Okay. Our price, however, so... Um, our cost at this point, our marginal cost, the cost to produce one additional unit is 450. However, people are six people are willing to pay 750 for this good. So at this point, we would make assume this is our average total cost as well. Assume we would make three dollars profit. Okay, your profit is the difference between the price and the average total cost at the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. At this point where MR equals MC, because that is the point where we maximize profit, your profit then is, the your profit per unit, is the difference between the average, to, the average revenue and the average total cost at that point, okay? And I know that's, that's a little bit esoteric, it's a little bit difficult, but just know, those are kind of the, the things to know is that Profits maximized at MR equals MC. And the actual profit you have at that point is the is the average revenue, your demand curve, minus average total cost at that point. Okay. And so the key thing with a monopolist is, is because the monopolist is able to set output at MR equals MC, it essentially has complete control over price because it doesn't have to worry about a competitor coming in and changing the demand, you know, changing, you know, changing the supply, which could affect the price and, and thus affect the output. So a monopolist can set the output and they can essentially artificially limit the output, if you will, but they're always going to set it at a point that maximizes profit, which is MR equals MC. Now, why does why is the marginal revenue half of the demand curve? Well, the reason why is the monopolist can charge different customers different prices. It can charge high prices to customers who are willing to pay more and charge low prices to customers who are willing to pay less. Now, and you're thinking, well, how does this work? Well, there's kind of a couple of ways it works. And one of them is, and you can see this in other forms too, like for example, you know, you go to the store to buy clothes and things might be like a sweater, maybe $40 at the beginning of the season. And then in the middle of the season, it's been marked down to 25. And at the end of the season, it's been marked down to 10. Okay. You have, so you've charged customers three different prices for the same good because the people who really, really, really want to buy that sweater early in the season are paying 40 bucks for it. The people who, you know, oh, it's the middle of the year, I'm kind of cold, I need a sweater, they'll pay 20, 25. And the people who are like, you know what, I know it's the end of the season, but I'd like to have a new sweater in my closet for next fall, they'll pay 10, okay? You have people willing to pay different prices for the same good. And so because of that, the extra revenue you get from selling one more good keeps going down. Okay, over time. So the marginal revenue keeps going down and thus um, the marginal revenue curve ends up being one half of the demand curve. So the other reason is what we call price discrimination. Price discrimination can happen when a seller charges different prices for the same product. Okay. And I know that you know, we often think, you know, the D word is a bad word here. Discrimination is a bad word, but there are times when it makes sense, okay? Price discrimination happens where you have essentially multiple markets for the same good, some of whom are willing to pay a high price, some of whom are not. And you want to sell to both customers. If you charge a low price, the people who are willing to pay a high price, you essentially lose out on profits from people who are willing to pay a higher price for that good. 
if you charge a high price, you lose profits from people who won't buy it. And so you want to find a way to sell to both. You, you know, the people who are willing to pay extra, get them to pay extra. But at the same time, the people who are not still find a way to sell to them. And so monopolists, because they can control the output, can usually price discriminate. And, you know, price discrimination is not Wendy's charges $2 for a, a sandwich at McDonald's charges one. Okay, that's not the same product. Price discrimination would be, you know, Wendy's charging one customer $2 for a junior cheeseburger and another customer 50 cents for the same junior cheeseburger. And you're going, that doesn't happen. But yes, it does. Because if you buy a, if you buy the junior cheeseburger a la carte, it may be two bucks. If you buy it as part of a kid's meal, it may, you know, the kid's meal itself with cheeseburger and some fries and a drink, maybe you know two fifty put together. Whereas if you bought those things a la carte, they might be five bucks. Okay, they've charged two different customers different prices for the same thing. Um, you know, kids menus at restaurants are great examples of price discrimination. Airlines price discriminate. Colleges price discriminate. You know, you may be pulling paying full tuition. Your roommate may be getting a free ride. If you go to a state school, in-state students pay significantly less than out-of-state students for the exact same education. If you, you know, at IU, I believe in-state tuition is about ten thousand dollars a year. Out-of-state tuition is like twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year. Okay, that's price discrimination. Somebody may be getting a scholarship; they're paying zero a year. Where is you're paying 10,000 10, a year? That's price discrimination. You're charging customers different prices for the exact same product. They're not getting any more or less education than you, you know, but they're paying more for it or they're paying less for it. Price discrimination generally happens in every form of business organization except the mythological existence of perfect competition. Um, for there to be price discrimination, there has to be four things that has to have to happen. Number one, the seller has to face a downward sloping demand curve. Um, so, you know, in other words, different customers willing to pay different prices. The seller must be able to segment the market by willing to find customers who are willing to pay different prices, to be able to charge some customers more and some customers less. And the other thing is it must be difficult for the good to be able to be bought at one price and sold at a higher price. And so, you know, here's a good example. You know, you can't resell an education and you really can't resell food. And it's hard to resell airline tickets. So as a result, those things, those are three industries where price discrimination happens a lot. You don't generally see price discrimination happening at, you know, say, Walmart because, you know, somebody could buy something really cheap at Walmart and then turn around and sell it at a higher price to somebody else. So, um, and so, you know, I, I know when I, when I went to IU, we, you know, student football tickets were sometimes, some years they were 10 bucks, some years they were free, but the general public football tickets were 20 to 30 bucks and eventually got a little higher. They're about 50 bucks now. And so why couldn't you just buy a student ticket, you know, buy a ticket off, you know, some enterprising students, of course they'd buy tickets intending to never go to games and then they could sell them at a profit to the general public who, yeah, okay. Hey, I'll pay you $15 for your ticket, but you know, I'll pay you 15 for your ticket, but um, you know, and that's cheaper than the $20 the box office would charge me. So here's the deal. If you want to get into a game with a student ticket, you have to show ID. You have to show a student ID that proves you are a student. If you're not proved, if you can't prove you're a student, you can't get in. And so that's the way they prevent re reselling. Um, but otherwise, it's you know things like food. That's why you have kids' meals at restaurants because they know, for example, a family. Hey, a family of four going out to eat. You pay full price. It gets really expensive. So if you offer a kids' meal, you know the the little munchkins who aren't necessarily going to eat that much, they can maybe get. A similar portion of what I'm getting, 
but they'll pay a lot less for it. And now if I know that it's not going to cost me a lot to take my kids out to eat, I'm more likely to go to that restaurant. Okay. And so um, airlines do this. They know that business travelers, their, their demand elasticity is inelastic. They, they do not want to spend very much time on the road. If I've got a meeting tomorrow, I want to fly out today and I want to get back tomorrow night. They also know that pleasure travelers are very price sensitive. They, you know, they're going on vacation. They don't want to, they don't want to blow the entire paycheck on vacation if they don't have to. And so what airlines will do is they'll charge really high prices to business travelers and really low prices to pleasure travelers. And the way they do that, it's hard to identify, okay, who's the business, who's the pleasure traveler. And so if you book your tickets early, which pleasure travelers usually do and business travelers don't, you get a discount. If you stay over a weekend, which pleasure travelers usually do and business travelers don't, you get a discount. If you stay at least seven days, again, which pleasure travelers do and business travelers don't, you get a discount. If you book your tickets at the last minute, you're only staying one or two days and you leave on a weekday and come back on a weekday, you're going to pay a higher price, especially if you leave on Monday and come back on Friday. Um, because those are generally assumed to be business travelers and not vacationers. And so, you know, that way you can kind of capture everybody, the people who are willing to pay more money, you can, you can essentially profit off of them. And the people who are willing to pay less, you can also get their business and profit off of them. So, um, and you know, that might explain why, you know, colleges charge different levels of tuition for different uh, students, you know, hey, look, the people who really want the premium experience and really, really, really want to go to your school are going to pay $30,000. Let them. The people who would love to go to your school, but it's a major financial hardship and would go to a different school otherwise, well, you want them to come too. So, you know, give them a scholarship to equate your price with somebody else's. And the people who you know are really, really intelligent and really getting good grades, and you know they'll be a great asset to your school, let them come for free. Give them a full ride, right? So the one thing about monopolists is that monopolists generally are perceived to misallocate resources because each monopolist produces and limits its output to MR equals MC. Even if consumers want more goods, the monopolist will not produce more unless their marginal revenue rises. Okay, which would indicate there would be an increase in demand. The demand would rise, the marginal revenue would rise, or marginal cost falls. It becomes cheaper to produce one additional unit of each good. And so because of that, we generally don't like monopolies. Although obviously if we've seen as we've seen earlier, the government essentially creates most monopolies or protects most monopolies through patents or ownership or franchises like they give to the power company. Monopolists generally will charge higher prices because there's no incentive for them to lower it because there's no competition that might be able to produce that good at a lower marginal cost and therefore a lower price. Because of that, monopolists can restrict their output. And while I don't consider this an economic problem, in the long run, each firm makes economic profit. And so obviously that's not going to be as good for the consumer. Whereas in perfect competition, each firm makes zero profit uh, in the long run. So the case for monopoly, at least listed in your book, is that when the rate of technological change is great, you know, you may see a greater change because the increased profits allow those monopolies then to invest those profits back into the company, and you know, you can kind of see this, the increased profits Lilly gets from having the exclusive right to sell a drug for 20 years, they're able to pour those profits into researching different drugs by hiring more people, by expanding their labs, whatever. And so as a result, you know, maybe they'll come up with more life-saving drugs. So that's kind of the case for Monopoly is, is that the increased profits often go back into the business, into hiring more people, into, you know, producing more medicines. And so that's why our patent system exists to encourage that and encourage that system of research and innovation. So 
that's that. So I'm going to stop recording.